Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, in many cases. Um, just to, to say that this webinar will be recorded and will be available at some point afterwards uh, for people who couldn't make it. Um, I, I'm John Simons, Head of Products at Cambustion. I hope everyone is safe and well at these very difficult times in the world. Um, it's a slightly grey day in England today, which is often the case, although we've had some very nice weather recently. OK, uh, I will uh, turn the camera off for the rest of this and go to my slides. OK. So today I'm going to talk about the new catalytic stripper accessory for the DMS 500 uh, for making the fastest time response measurements of solid engine particles uh, above or below 23 nanometers. So the content of my talk is as follows. I'm going to give a short introduction to combustion. Uh, I'm then going to talk about the DMS 500. For those of you who are not familiar, I see amongst the attendees that, that many of you already have a DMS 500. Um, and that's good. And you can see how the CSA can be integrated with your existing DMS 500. Uh, I'm then going to talk about volatile particle removal and why we wish to remove the volatile particles. Uh, I'll then introduce the catalytic stripper accessory and talk about how it integrates with the existing DMS dilution system. I'll then discuss the inevitable but minimal particle losses in the system. I will then go on to describe how we've measured uh, the efficiency at removing particles of the catalytic stripper and its solid particle loss characterization. I will talk about time response of the system, uh, how it's in, why it's important uh, and what it means and how we validated the time response of the CSA and DMS system. I then show uh, probably the most interesting part as some data from a gasoline engine using the CSA and the DMS. And I finally describe how the catalytic stripper accessory can be used with the dual sampling accessory, which allows switching between upstream and downstream for filter efficiency measurement. OK, so a bit about combustion. Combustion was founded uh, 33 years ago uh, as an offshoot of Cambridge University Engineering Department. Um, initially developed that the fast response FID for measuring hydrocarbons, a product which is now in its sixth generation uh, with a one millisecond time response. Uh, later, we set up an engineering services division uh, which does uh, contract consultancy focused on emissions measurement and optimization. Um, our headquarters is in Cambridge in the UK, hence the name. Uh, we have an office in Shanghai and we have representation, exclusive representation in France, Germany, India and Japan and other territories served from the UK. Um, we're an independent private company and remain so. And we pride ourselves on our highly skilled employees, which are mostly at graduate and PhD level. We have strong links with universities, both the university from where we came, Cambridge, and also increasingly universities all over the world. Uh, that leads to valuable collaborations and sponsorships of relevant projects. We've generally always at least got one PhD project bubbling along in the background with the university somewhere. So there are two distinct um, business units in Cambustion. There's the products division, which I lead, which develops, manufacture, and supports um, fast response analyzers and other emissions related equipment. In the terms of those sort of automotive based instruments, uh, we measure gas, gas including hydrocarbons, NOx, and CO and CO2. Uh, we also, in the last 20 years or so, have been making particulate analyzers and also non automotive particulate analyzers for aerosol science. Uh, we also make a uh, diesel particulate filter and gasoline particulate filter testing system. Um, the engineering services division uh, is a, a paid consultancy business that undertakes emissions calibration and engine after treatment system evaluation and uses dynamometer simulations of drive cycles. And we also have a vehicle chassis role. The, the, the take home point here is that uh, we don't just develop and design and make emissions instrumentation. We're experts at using it too. We, we are our own customers in that regard, if that makes sense. So a recap on the DMS 500, it is a fast electrical mobility sizer. It gives you size, number and mass in real time. 
Uh, we introduced it to the market 18 years ago now, and it has a size range of five nanometers to one micron, or in a special version, two and a half microns, which could be switched between the one micron and two and a half micron ranges. It gives you 10 hertz data, but most importantly, it does that with a 200 millisecond time response. So it will respond to a step change in concentration in just 200 milliseconds. It has an integrated dilution system, which was added in 2004, uh, which is two stages and is bypassable. The Mark II generation, which was a, a considerable upgrade on the original version, was introduced in 2009. And all in all, there are now several hundred units around the world. So these are present in universities and research institutions, but they're also present in OEMs, in engine manufacturers, in vehicle manufacturers, working 24 hours a day uh, in test cells, in basements all over the world, uh, doing valuable engine calibration work, which doesn't tend to get published because it's proprietary, but they're there acting as work causes and they've been designed for that role. Here's an animation on the principle of the DMS 500. There is a classification column. Uh, in the actual DMS 500, this is up and down. Uh, for convenience, we've put this horizontally. So there's a column with a classification area and a charger. So here we have a high voltage wire which puts a positive charge on the particles entering the classifier. When the particles leave the charger, they then enter this classifier where they meet a sheet flow of clean air. The positive charge is repelled by this high voltage rod in the middle and particles will land on one of these 22 detectors. The small particles are very mobile, are deflected and move very easily, and they land at the top of the column here, and the large particles land at the bottom. And depending, each of these rings is connected to a, a current detector, an electrometer or an amp meter. Um, the amount of current induced is proportional to the number of particles in some way, or is related to at least. That gives you a concentration and the ring on which the particle lands gives you the electrical mobility which is converted into particle size for small particles here and large particles down here. So why might we want, given we have this instrument which can measure all particles, whether they be solid or liquid, volatile or non-volatile, why do we now want to remove the volatile particles? Well, as ever in this industry, it's because the regulators say we must. So the regulations designed the so-called by the PMP panel, uh, by the UN uh, Economic Council for Europe, uh, said that we must remove the volatile particles uh, for legislation in Europe and increasingly in other parts of the world. Why did they say that? Because the volatile aerosols are not stable. They depend upon how you measure them and the conditions of measurement on the day in which you measure them. So it depends on things like humidity, temperature, pressure. This means you cannot make repeatable measurements of volatile aerosols, they change. And if you cannot make repeatable measurements, then how can you compare to see if you've improved your calibration? And how can you make homologation measurements to say that one vehicle passes the test and another one does not? Um, so in their wisdom, the regulators said, well, we'll simply remove these particles, just leaving the solid ones which don't change. So how do we usually remove those particles? Well, we use something called a thermodiluter. Uh, it uses heat to evaporate the volatile particles and then it dilutes, which reduces the partial pressure of the gases formed, which prevents recondensation when the aerosol eventually cools. So we have the sample on the left, which is usually in a dilution tunnel. We then have a first stage of dilution at 150 degrees centigrade, which is hot. That evaporates the particles combined with this evaporation tube, or in some cases now a catalytic stripper, which is also allowed in the most recent regulations. And then we have a second stage of dilution. Now that second stage of dilution is principally there to cool down the sample because we're actually gonna count these particles with a condensation particle counter here on the right and condensation particles cannot normally take a hot sample. So this is designed to reduce the temperature effectively. 
So an obvious question is, why do we not just put one of these on front of a DMS 500? Let's just put a thermo diluter on the front of the DMS 500, one that you can effectively buy from any manufacturer. Well, the problem is that in order to use one of these particle counters, which can count individual single particles, you need a lot of dilution. And this is too much for an electrometer-based instrument such as the DMS. It reduces the sensitivity too much. Every time you have an order of magnitude of dilution, it's an order of magnitude less sensitivity. So we have to come up with a slightly different solution for the DMS. So those of you who have a DMS 500 uh, will know that we have a scheme which fits curves to the data. So in red, we have the overall size spectrum. This is size, this is concentration. And we fit the peaks in this data uh, and we assume that the small particles are the nucleation mode and the larger particles are the accumulation mode. Some of you may be familiar with the paper by Professor David Kittleson of Minnesota University, where he describes the emissions, the particle emissions from a diesel engine as consisting of three modes. There is this nucleation volatile mode, there is this accumulation soot mode, and there is also a coarse mode, which from the exhaust can often be uh, re-entrained large particles from the exhaust pipe and from the overall vehicle is things like brakes and tire wear. So we fit these two modes to the data and then we say well we're only interested in these solid particles so let's just ignore these nucleation mode particles. So we use this solid accumulation mode as the soot particles and that's worked pretty well over the years however in some situations it does not work so well. It does not work so well if these peaks are very close together. So if the accumulation mode is very small or if the nucleation mode is very large. And sometimes they're even mixed up in reality. Um, the, the real world doesn't fall neatly into uh, log normal distributions. Um, so that served us reasonably well, but it, it can be improved. So here we come to the catalytic stripper accessory, which you can see sitting on top of the DMS. That, that, that's the extra bit. Um, a catalytic stripper is more suited to a pure thermodiluter, which doesn't have a catalyst in, because it needs much, much less dilution to work. In fact, it technically doesn't even need any dilution. It just needs a source of oxidant gas, i.e. oxygen. Um, this removes the regulation more than 99% of tetracontane, C40, and uh, the system as a whole has a, a, a particle loss profile that roughly equates to a D50 or 23 nanometers. And there is a loss correction built in to the software, which I'll come on to later. The take home message is by adding this accessory, we have not compromised the time response of the DMS. We can still have a time response, including the heated line of 300 milliseconds. This plot shows uh, what happens when you apply this to uh, a gasoline engine. Uh, in blue, we have the spectrum with no catalytic stripper. We add the catalytic stripper and that plot is in red. And you can see the small nucleation mode has pretty much disappeared. In fact, anything less must be solid. <coughs> the catalytic stripper accessory fits in uh, topologically to our existing um, uh, dilution system. So this is the existing dilution system on the DMS. You have this primary dilution, which is uh, at the end of the heated line here, which is connected as close as you can to the exhaust pipe. Just a short length of stainless steel tube to allow the temperature to reduce down if it's very, very hot in the exhaust. We have a, a primary dilution of a factor of five in here, which stops condensation. In the case of the CSA, it also adds oxygen. If your engine is running very rich, the catalyst in the CSA will need oxygen in order to do its job. The CSA then fits in here, which is actually at the end of this pipe. So the, the sample then goes into the CSA and comes out of the CSA. So everything you see on top of the DMS here is represented by this block here. It then can go straight into the DMS and for many purposes that will be good enough because um, you only need that factor of five dilution just to stop condensation and give you enough oxygen to run the, um, to run the CSA. <laughs> this extra diluter, the rotating distillator, is really just there to adjust the concentration into a level it reduces the cleaning interval of the instrument. So this diluter works as it always has done um, by uh, 
cleaning most of the air using this HEPA filter, and then using this disc which rotates at a varying speed to carry little pockets of dirty sample into the second um, into the second flow, which is clean. <clears throat> and by speeding up the disc, you can add more sample and reduce um, the dilution. Um, but for many clean engines, you won't need to use that and just use the one-to-one -one path. And that factor of five is the minimum dilution that you can use then. So the CSA in detail, uh, there it is, a slightly bigger sitting on top of the DMS. Um, if you want to bypass it, you simply change the plumbing. You simply change the pipe. So normally it's plumbed in here. <clears throat> if you don't want to use the CSA, then you disconnect it and just put it straight in the front as you always would do with the DMS. What's in the box? Well, there's an inlet and an outlet. There is a heated catalyst in this box. There is also an active outlet temperature control, and that reduces the temperature in a controlled way <coughs> down to 80 degrees, and then it can go straight into the DMS, and it keeps it at that temperature constantly rather than just leaving it to chance how it cools down for more repeatable measurements and loss measurements. And then we've got the electronics, the controllers, Ethernet interface to integrate it with the DMS um, computer and software. OK, I'm going to talk about the dilution scheme, which, as I say, is the existing DMS dilution scheme. So broadly speaking, if you double the dilution, you halve the sensitivity. So if you have a system that had a minimum of 10 to 1 dilution, then that's going to have half the sensitivity of a system with the instrument being the same as a system with 5 to 1 primary dilution. So we need to keep that as low as possible. If you use a constant volume sampling system, which is a dilution tunnel often used for bagged emissions measurement, where you want to know the total gas uh, species at the end of the test over a drive cycle, the dilution, though it varies, can be as much as 100. So it is better in any case to sample directly from the exhaust pipe for the best time response. You always need some dilution. So the first dilution factor of five is the minimum you need to stop condensation of water in the instrument if you've got a stoichiometric gasoline. But also, don't forget, it provides oxygen for the catalyst. You don't need to use that second stage of dilution, though. It's nothing to do with volatile particle removal unless you're dealing with a very high concentration aerosol, and that's so you can reduce the maintenance intervals. So you need to clean the instrument less often if you put less soot into it. This first stage, uh, including the catalytic stripper, meets the tetracontane test for PMP as it is. Now some details of the dilution system of the DMS 500, which has been in place since 2004. All we've done now is add the CSA in. So dilution factor is defined as a diluted sample flow divided by a raw sample flow. Note I talk in terms of dilution factor and not dilution ratio, as dilution ratio can be somewhat confusing and is less easy to correct by. The dilution factor of the first dilution system is the diluted sample flow, which is measured by this mass flow controller M1, divided by the raw sample flow. And the raw sample flow is the flow in here from the exhaust pipe, which is the difference between that total flow and the dilution air flow that's coming in here. So M1 divided by M1 subtracted from M2. The second dilution factor, in this case, the diluted sample flow is again M1. And the raw sample flow is given by the volumetric flow imparted by this disk. So this disk has holes in it of a known fixed volume, a certain number of them. And it's turning around at a speed S, a frequency S. And the bigger S is, the bigger the volume that's being imparted to this uh, second arm of the diluter into the clean flow. Um, because all these other um, flows are in terms of mass flow, we need to convert that volumetric flow of the disk into a mass flow. And we do that as a function of the pressure and temperature uh, in the disk, which is measured. Quick word about the rotating disk diluter. Here is the actual dilution disk in place in my hand. Uh, recently, someone suggested that 
those discs might wear up very quickly. And in fact, they don't. We went to some trouble to choose a slippery enough material that really doesn't happen. In fact, before this webinar, I had a look on our spare parts list, which is on our website. It's not actually listed as a spare part for sale because simply it doesn't really wear out. I mean, we don't even change it routinely at service. Um, so they last for many, many years uh, and have proven to be very reliable over these uh, last 16 years. Um, if you look at these expressions for dilution factor, particularly the first dilution factor, you can see this depends quite heavily on the difference between this flow meter and this flow meter. And it's easy to check those two flow meters against each other. If you block the uh, exhaust pipe flow, as it's shown on here, the, the flow into the end of the sample line, um, then those two flows must equal each other because there can be no makeup flow from this inlet here. So in that case, uh, if, they're, if they're not the same, they can be adjusted. Okay. All particle transit systems, whether they be diluter sampling lines, have losses. The key is to minimize those losses and to know what they are and keep them constant. So the, line, the losses in the CSA system consist of the losses in the sample line, which has always been there, which is mainly by diffusion. <coughs> Much worse for the smaller particles. The, um, in, in the CSA itself, you've also got diffusive losses. We've also got thermophoretic losses, which are caused by the, the sudden change in temperature, um, which is largely not a function of particle size and applies even at the large end. Um, those two uh, models uh, multiply together to give you the total losses in the system. You can now uh, select in software whether you have uh, a sample line of a certain length or a CSA fitted and automatically correct for those losses. The, um, <clears throat> I'll go in detail about those, well, in some detail about those two, uh, two models coming off, um, but uh, certainly the, the sample line model we've actually been using for years, but offline via Excel rather than integrated with the software. So it's, it's pretty well proven. Um, the loss in the CSA is, uh, is modeled by the manufacturer, including these two models here for diffusion and thermophoresis. Um, the line loss was a, a model developed, uh, well, partially by me uh, in conjunction with uh, various other researchers, including Prashant Kumar at Surrey University. I think some of his faculty might be on the line. Um, yeah, we did some work here on, on sampling tube losses uh, and the various circumstances. It was all designed for support Prashant's work on environmental monitoring that involve very long lines. We came up with a model that's actually a turbulent model, even though our sample line is technically in the laminar flow regime. That works very well and we've been using it ever since and it's now been integrated into the software. The legislation uses a condensation particle counter which has a size cut. Um, this size cut up till now has been legislated to be a 50% penetration at 23 nanometers. This has been because the volatile particles are very small and therefore this is a kind of belt and braces, as we would say, approach to making sure that we don't measure those smaller particles. Um, proposed legislation for Euro 6E and also Euro 7 is going to bring this down to 10 nanometers so we can capture some more of these smaller particles which are thought to be harmful to human health. We've used, in order to simulate that in the DMS and give that same measurement, uh, we're using this relationship developed by the University of Oxford, uh, which gives uh, a mathematical equivalent of that roll-off function in a condensation particle counter, both for 23 nanometers and for 10 nanometers. And this is now built into the DMS software. So you can now select a 23 nanometer cutoff or a 10 nanometer cutoff. So here we have the experimental setup used to validate the catalytic stripper accessory. So on the left-hand side, we have various sources of particles, both solid and volatile. At the top, we have a mini cast, which is a propane soot generator with a flame in it. So this is followed by another catalytic stripper accessory just to ensure the particles coming out of that propane flame are in fact all solid. Below that, we have a sodium chloride particle source, which consists of a nebulizer with sodium chloride solution in it and a diffusion dryer to remove the water from those particles. At the bottom for generating very small particles, we have a silver source. This consists of a hot silver wire with air blowing over it, which creates a condensation aerosol of silver. Above that, we have a tetracontane source for the semi-volatile particles. The tetracontane is naturally at room temperature, a kind of wax. We heat that up in a crucible and we put compressed air over it, which then creates a condensation aerosol of tetracontane. In the middle, 
we have a particle selection mechanism. And this is uh, a differential mobility analyzer which selects particles by their size. Um, so you can enter a certain size in nanometers and it will select sizes over a, a narrow range of any of these aerosols. We then split the flow out of that into a Faraday cup electrometer. Now a Faraday cup electrometer is a primary standard for particle number. In fact, it's what use, is used to calibrate condensation particle counters. So we go straight to this comparing particle number. The other side of the flow is goes into the DMS 500, which can either go through the heated line and the catalytic stripper accessory or directly into the DMS 500. So we can compare with and without line and CSA. So in terms of volatile particle removal, the legislation says that you need to remove 99% of tetracontane at 30 nanometers. So here's the size distribution of tetracontane at 30 nanometers going straight into the DMS. We then take out, put the, sorry, put the line in and the CSA and we remove virtually all of those particles. In fact, if you look on the left hand side here, uh, this is the direct measurement. So we have this reference electrometer, by the way, that shows that the DMS does correctly measure these volatile particles. Um, and then we put the CSA in and we reduce it down to this level. The legislation only requires it to be down to reduce down to this level. So we are well ahead of what the legislation requires. In terms of solid particle penetration and our model, the model here for a seven meter line is given in blue. And we have various solid particles here that we are putting through the line. We have soot in black, we have sodium chloride salt in yellow, and we have silver in silver or gray. And as you can see, within the bounds of the area of the experiments, those match the model. So I'm going to talk about uh, combustion speciality, which is fast response. So engines are never steady state, even when you want them to be, even when you try very hard to make them be. Um, at 1500 RPM, which is not that fast, the exhaust stroke lasts just 20 milliseconds in a full stroke. All uh, modern drive cycles consist of some strand transients, even the NEDC did, um, although that was comparatively a steady state drawn by a bureaucrat. Um, the American FTP 75 is, is highly transient and based on a real drive. And the WLTC, although uh, written up by, uh, by officials, is actually designed to mimic real world driving. And also you've got the non-road transient cycle. <laughs> so if you want to make, if you've got a, a transient emission, a transient drive cycle, you're going to get transient emissions. And sometimes the, it's the, even the transient nature of that drive cycle that gives you higher emissions. So this is why we've had some recent scandals a few years ago uh, with uh, in-lab driving not matching real-world driving. Uh, real-world driving is a much harder situation and often the, the transient nature actually creates emissions problems. And when that happens, you want to know when that happens, which is why you need a fast time response instrument. So what do we mean by time response? It means the time taken for the whole instrument to respond to a step change in concentration. We usually express this as the time taken to rise or fall between two levels of concentration, often 10% and 90%. So we call this T10 to 90. Uh, this is not the same as the transport delay, which is the, the time taken for, uh, for the sample to go through the pipes in the system, which is also constant, but it's just simply a constant offset when aligning instruments. The data rate is the sampling rate at which the electronics and communications return the data, usually expressed in hertz. These are often confused and interchanged and even obscured sometimes. Time resolution could mean either. So for those of you who cast your minds back to your undergraduate days at university, you may remember Nyquist criterion. And it says that we need to sample data at twice the highest frequency available in the sample. So in this case, that means that your data rate needs to be at least twice the time response of your instrument. And this makes perfect sense for the DMS. So the DMS without any heated line has a time response of 200 milliseconds. And we sample the data at 10 Hertz, which is 100 milliseconds, a factor of two. Now we could sample the DMS data. We could change the electronics and, change and sample it at 10 milliseconds or one millisecond. But there will be no point because the time response of the instrument is 200 milliseconds. Sampling any faster does not make any difference. So we need to make that distinction between the sample rate and the time response. 
This should illustrate that difference more clearly. So on the left hand side, we have in green a step response. Uh, this is a modeled step. And then we show the effect of slowing that down to various time responses. So we have the raw DMS time response of 200 milliseconds in red. Each of these dots is at 10 hertz, 100 milliseconds. They're all at 10 hertz. But we show the effect of slowing down the time response. Firstly, we curve off the response. We go to 500 milliseconds. We curve it off further. The time we get to one second, it's no longer even a rectangle. It's a triangle. The question is, now we've put this CSA on the world's fastest particle sizer, have we still got a fast time response? Yes, we have. So even with the heated line, without the CSA, the instrument has a 300 millisecond time response. We still have a 300 millisecond time response. So what we've got here is a pipe on the front of the DMS with a solid aerosol in, and I remove the pipe very quickly, which causes the sample concentration to fall down to the ambient level. And you can see there are one, two, three data points in that fall, 300 milliseconds. I then push the pipe back on and it rises up again. This is slow because it takes me some time to push the pipe on and it goes onto a little barb and that is not a quick process compared with taking the pipe off. Uh, what does this all mean in terms of the, the effect on the data? So I, I looked at modeling some of this. So if we have a true change in concentration here given in black, and we have uh, a DMS 500 with a 200 millisecond intrinsic response in red, slightly slows the data. We then have the full CSA and heated line, 300 milliseconds. Now, a PMP system that you can buy on the market might have a time response of say, five seconds in fact um, but let's just say let, let's be generous and say a system has a time response of two seconds then you can see the effect here even though it's still 10 hertz data in this example it's really really slowed down and why does that actually matter then what could you hope to see with a faster response system well in red here we have some uh, real engine data from a gasoline engine this is DMS particle concentration given in red. The top here, we have the fuel air equivalence ratio, lambda, measured with a lambda sensor. And you can see this is under closed loop control, it's oscillating. You can see those oscillations in the red DMS data. Each of these dots is at 10 Hertz, and you can see those oscillations. So you know at that point that that particular sub problem is caused by fuel air equivalence ratio, and your calibrators can do something to that control strategy, which can change the soot. If we slow that data down artificially to a two second time response, still at 10 Hertz, the dots are still here, then you don't actually see these wiggles anymore. You still see some sort of gross change in the concentration, but you're missing the correlation between that lambda closed loop control and those particle uh, concentration changes. If we look at the size spectrum, it's even more apparent. So we have this instrument that which can measure the size spectrum in real time and give you this nice waterfall plot. And you can see all these features. If we slow that down to two seconds, never mind five seconds, you can see those features have been lost, even though this is still 10 hertz. So variability in the CSA. Uh, this is a time when we had seven systems uh, back to back in the lab, some with a seven meter line and some with a five meter line. We've got two different models here because there's slightly different losses in the seven liter line and the five liter, five meter line. <coughs> we have solid particle losses at um, 23 and 100 nanometers. Um, and you can see they're all pretty consistent. Uh, in terms of volatile particle removal, we have the R83 minimum on the right hand side in green and all these systems exceed that by some degree. Okay, down to the bit which I expect most of you will find the most interesting, what happens when we try this on a car engine? So here we have a light duty gasoline under the world light duty test protocol test. We have in the dilution tunnel, a standard commercial PMP style uh, solid particle number measurement system. So a two stage thermodiluter with a 23 nanometer cut CPC. We have the DMS sampling raw from the exhaust, so not in the same place as the PMP system. 
Under test A, we have no catalytic stripper, no loss correction for said stripper. Uh, we do a log normal fit to the accumulation mode as we always did. In test B, we have the catalytic stripper fitted with its loss correction, and we use the total um, size spectrum rolled off to 23 nanometers to get our proxy for solid particle number. On the right hand side, we have cumulative particles over the test. So this is done by integrating up the particle concentration multiplied by the flow either in the tunnel in the case of the PMP system and in the exhaust in the case of the DMS. So this is total particle number. This is like we've bagged everything over the test. Um, and you can see the solid lines are the two DMS tests with log normal fit in blue and with the catalytic stripper and the corrections in red. And you can see in this case, for this particular engine, uh, those things agree very, very well. And that's because this engine is well behaved in terms of accumulation mode and nucleation mode being well separated. The log normal fit does a good job. And this is a good sanity check that things are working as we expect and we haven't broken anything here. Um, you can see the cumulative emissions from the PMP system in the dotted lines. So in the tunnel, we have it in blue and in, uh, well, in both cases in the tunnel. Um, but you can see that those lines agree well with each other, which shows the tests are repeatable and our dyno is running as we expect. You can also see a pretty good correlation uh, with what the DMS is doing in absolute number terms as well, bearing in mind the systems are sampling from two completely different locations. The power of the system uh, with the DMS and the CSA does not come in the cumulative emissions. You can do that with the homologation system. The power here comes in the transient emissions in real time. And here you can see great big spikes um, in, in the DMS data, which are very uh, well resolved in time compared with the PMP system, which is in black, which has not resolved those spikes in any way near as well. And there's the power in being able to find where the spikes in our emissions really are. OK. Um, this really is my final point now. Um, we have this uh, piece of equipment called the dual sampling accessory. It's been around for a few years in a couple of different uh, forms. It essentially uh, allows you to sample between two points into the DMS, um, upstream with a GPF or DPF and downstream usually, so you can do filtration efficiency studies. Uh, you can use this with a CSA and you can stack your CSA up on top of the DSA a kind of skyscraper arrangement. Um, you can use it as you would now and just put the CSA in here and have two sampling locations up and downstream of a filter. Or you can use the DSA to bypass the CSA to switch between stripped and unstripped, uh, which could be useful for some sort of research pro projects where you want to see the difference between the two situations. OK, that's the end of my talk. I just have some uh, advertisements, as it were. We have another webinar coming uh, next week, uh, next Thursday, so a week today at this time. Ryan Mulholland will be talking about the Cambustion DPG, which is our automated DPF and GPF testing system. At this same time, register at cambustion.com slash webinars. In two weeks' time, I will be giving uh, a more aerosol science-based presentation on the aerodynamic aerosol classifier. This is our instrument for selecting particle size from 25 nanometers to over 5 microns, which doesn't have problems with charging like, like DMAs and also selects aerodynamic diameter that's useful for filtration studies and things like that. Uh, that is in two weeks' time, and I'll also be doing a repeat on the Friday, as I will with this talk, be doing a repeat tomorrow. Uh, for people in Asian time zones. And really, finally now, the Cambridge Particle Meeting that's been running uh, from Cambridge University, started by Nick Collins, as was Cambustion, um, uh, this year will be held online. We can't meet in person. So on Friday the 19th of June, uh, we'll be holding this, uh, this particle conference. Um, we've got a program lined up of, of exciting and distinguished speakers from all over the world. And you can now register via www.cambridgeparticlemeeting.org. It'll be held via Zoom on that date. So I hope that plenty of people might be able to go who haven't been able to go before when it's been physically held in Cambridge. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so uh, there's a question here. Um, can existing DMS 500 customers use the CSA? The answer is, Yes, um, 
uh, you can just plug it in. In most cases, uh, I think that's right, Chris, isn't it? There might be some older units that might need a heated line upgrade. Is that correct? Um, but generally, yeah, I don't. Uh, can, everybody, can people hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you now, Chris. Um, yeah, so very old units would need um, the heated line upgrading to run at one nine one degrees. But uh, units sold in the last uh, probably five years, it's simply plug and play. You just connect it up and turn it on. Yeah. So, so for, for, for units in the last five years, we can just ship a CSA. Um, although we'd always recommend you have your instrument service and calibrated, of course. Um, but before that, we probably need to have the heated line back and upgrade that to take the higher temperature of 191. But yes, it's it's a the nice thing about it is it just inserts in the existing dilution system, and uh, you just have a new software disk, and that's that's pretty pretty straightforward. So. Uh, the, the, this question here, which DMS model can handle uh, PM 2.5? It's actually the same model. Uh, it's just had some extra hardware added to it to change some of the uh, the voltages inside. And usually, uh, we um, we make it switchable between one micron and two and a half micron. Why do we not make all DMSs two and a half micron? It's because you actually get a slightly slower time response at two and a half microns. It goes down to 500 milliseconds and you get less spectral resolution. It's like you get all the particle sizes, but but slightly squashed if you see, you, you don't get as much spectral resolution. So for most purposes, if one micron is enough, one micron is enough, but for those who need the PM 2.5, we can add a switchable system. So you can put it back to as it was or expand it to two and a half microns. So it, it's the same thing. It's the same instrument, but that's just a, an additional piece of hardware and a calibration. Uh, somebody's asked that there'll be a recording. Yes, there will. This is being recorded. Um, so uh, I will put up a recording at some point. Um, and I'll contact people. Uh, it's a question here. Would you please tell us about the DMS connection ports to the sampling pipes and tubes? Um, is this in terms of the, the sample from the from the engine, um, the sample from the engine just goes into a quarter inch BSP fitting, which you can put a swage lock connection in on the end of the heated line. Um, you just need a short stub of stainless steel pipe from the hot exhaust to the uh, end of the heated line. That's it really, just a, a piece of quarter, quarter inch or six millimeter tube is what you need. Current Euro 6 stipulates a solid particle number of 600 billion particles per kilometer. Yep, I think that's American billions rather than UK billions, but you know, it's, uh, it's UK billions, right? Reduced to 23 nanometers will allow wall flow DPFs to catch these particles or limits need to increase. Um, I, I honestly don't know. If you mean a reduction to 10 nanometers, uh, the thing is, it's actually easier in some ways to capture smaller particles in a DPF. It's generally, you can, as you can see with sample lines, it's generally easier to, to, to capture 10 nanometer particles than 23 nanometer particles. Uh, the, the, the challenge is actually transporting small particles as you find in instrumentation, which is why you need to worry about sample line losses and that kind of thing. So I think that's to be, to be seen. It honestly depends what's there when, when people look. If engines are producing large amounts of ash, uh, then there may be a nasty surprise for people at smaller sizes. And we've got a question about uh, EU7 and, and, and test mode, so e, e, and possibly CN7. Uh, so the, e, the current plan for EU7, as far as we know, is to have a 10 nanometer size cut. Um, they're still in some discussion, although it's getting more and more uh, set in the legislation. So uh, the idea with that legislation is you would simply select the 10 nanometer size cut from the DMS software uh, if that legislation comes in. And of course, many manufacturers are assuming that this will happen and people are already using this system to see the effects and see if they can pass the forthcoming legislation. Uh, I've also heard that uh, it will come in before Euro 7 uh, in a proposed Euro 6E amendment to the Euro 6 legislation. Uh, this is the latest knowledge that I have. This is all subject to change. Okay, then. Well, Chris has given, if you look in the chat window, Chris has given the link that I've 
put in this presentation, make it easier for you to find. So Cambridge Particle Meeting, uh, the product pages for the CSA, and the webinars that are coming up. So cambushion.com slash webinars. Um, I encourage you to visit those links and maybe register for various webinars and indeed the Cambridge Particle Meeting, which is always a very, very good meeting. Um, and I, at that point, if there are no other questions, our time is pretty much up. So uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining me today and I hope you all stay safe and I hope we'll all be able to, to see each other in person soon one day. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to traveling again. So thank you and have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you.